So going back to our lovely diagram here. Um, <laughs> so we've talked about two of the workflows that we've uh, deployed. Um, and in each case, there's some area uh, of machine learning, and there's an area of the, sci the scientist being fully involved in the progress. Um, what we want to do is we want to aggregate all these approaches together at the end. Uh, we want to, to be scientists, and we want to come up with the approaches uh, that are backed with multiple sources of independent evidence that would lead us to something that looks like a great candidate. Yeah, because I think what we found during this process was being naturally highly competitive individuals was we all want to support our own flows, right? Brigitte wants the uh, patient stratification one to work and Ali wants the multi-hop to work. So we thought scientifically the best way for us to get around that was to uh, build what we call a leaderboard. And the idea was could you take all of your models and apply that to some gold standard benchmark that you could measure against for something like glioblastoma stem cells? Um, and then uh, could we measure how good our models do? Well, we actually found that uh, the best models were the ones that were aggregated together, um, and they performed the best uh, around those. So we took the targets from the models that were aggregated together, uh, and that's what we actually triaged as part of the next step. Yeah, so our, our scientists will sit down, and they, they can go through all of these lists, and they, I don't know, they can sort of swipe left when they look at a gene that they don't really <laughs> like the look of. He's not even joking. They literally can swipe left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any Tinder users in the house? <laughs> no? Yeah, we, we did actually build uh, a tool called Chemda, uh, which is like a Tinder for chemicals where scientists would go in and they, they would just look at a picture of a molecule and actually some, some chemists can look at a molecule and say, no, that's not a drug, and they, just, they would just swipe it left. I'd like to say as a product manager, I had nothing to do with that design at all. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. So nowadays we we have a tool uh, where scientists can make make more sort of refined judgments yeah, as, exactly. as to uh, what we're going to spend millions of dollars on, um, uh, with all the kind of metadata they need in order to make fair and unbiased choices. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like just getting a target. We do get a lot of information of why the target was inferred. So like expression, a lot of things, and that gives an informed choice. It's, in the end, we do swipe left or right, but we do have information to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so on the next slide. Oh, yeah, so. so. So just to, as we conclude this process, so once we have a list of ranked targets produced from the disease sprint, we validate these experimentally in our labs in Cambridge. We have a research facility there with over 35 um, now uh, wet, wet, lab, wet lab scientists. Um, so what you see in this video is really the process of them sort of going through this experimental phase. Um, but this month now in our Cambridge research facility, we started testing the glioblastoma stem cells in a disease-relevant assay with patient-derived cells. So we do real science at Benevolent, and we're working in collaboration with leading research institutes to make sure that these experiments are as realistic as possible and that they inform the next stage of the development of these hypotheses so that we can get to designing and developing a molecule for the right patient group and to get these out of the lab and into uh, clinical trials. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the, the next thing that we need to do is we need to design the right drug to hit that target. So we talked about chemical structures and and swiping left and right, but realistically, we need to bring together all of those factors that make a good, a good molecule so that we can address the challenge of penetrating the stem cells, um, penetrating the blood-brain barrier, and ensuring that we can treat those stem cells so they don't replicate and create new tumors. Now, to achieve this, we've developed another AI technology that we call EvoChem that basically um, it uses multi-parametric optimization to design and synthesize the right molecule to hit that target so that we can um, modulate it and we can have potential to influence those cells. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that platform is what we call EvoChem, and I've got a video of it this time, not a live uh, demonstration in the background. What you can see there is, if you think about the chemical space, it is actually quite complicated. There's something like 10 to the power of 60 potential chemical structures that one could make to make a good drug. That's a massive amount. So what we did is we trained AI to understand what good chemical structures look like and how they can predict what it looks like to get through the body. And for some of those parameters, for example, blood-brain barrier penetrance. 
what we found was with the EvoChem um, uh, platform, what we asked was chemists can go in, they can uh, ask for what features they want to have a good drug look like, and one of these would be blood-brain barrier yeah. penetrance, for example, but there's a whole bunch of other factors that are all interplaying. And the system will go away, we'll look at this chemical structure, and it will provide a number of novel structures you may not have seen as a chemist before, because it's in spaces your research has never taken into. So it's kind of taking that bias away again. What we found was we didn't just take these um, chemical structures forward by themselves that the AI produced. We found the perfect examples were where the system, like, produced chemicals like this, the chemist could come into the system, actually interact with them, design, uh, or modify, and adapt them to tweak them a little bit, kind of using the AI as an inspiration engine. And that was quite powerful because those were the ones we found to be the most effective. What we saw as a result, uh, and a net result of this in some of our programs, is you can design far fewer chemicals uh, in a much quicker space of time because you're augmenting this with massive help from the AI, but you also synthesize far fewer in the lab because you have less cycles of these that you have to take forward. And that's incredible because that data we can also learn from and further power the systems. Yeah. So today we've um, taken you through the entire platform end to end from data ingestion all the way to where we have a preclinical candidate. So we've um, identified how we, I, how we find the right target, how we design and develop the molecule to hit that target, and then how do we define the patient population that is most likely to receive a therapeutic benefit from that drug. And that's the process end to end. Yeah, so, so like I mentioned in the precision medicine team, we are learning from the patient data, not just to identify new targets that would work for the patient subgroup, but also take this one step forward and be able to design better clinical trials for those patients. So, so the machine learning models that we are develop, developing, so we identify both clinical and molecular mechanisms that could underlie similar patients, right? So, and we, we can then identify patients, subgroups that are more likely to respond to the drug we are developing, and then design our clinical trial arms much better so you can balance for the responders versus those who, who might not respond. So this increases the chance of your drug uh, having a success at the clinical trial, right? So in a clinical trial, you have to statistically show that your drug works in comparison to a placebo or a standard of care that's out there. So uh, to actually enhance that statistical significance, if we were to find the right subgroups that respond to our drug, that does increase the power of the clinical trial to achieve like more success than normal clinical trial would. So there is something we could do with the machine learning models and impact the trial design here, and that's exactly what we are doing, to use the data, yeah. find those responders, find those patients, and design trials for them. So, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So just in conclusion, like this approach will help us um, find the right and um, precise treatment for patients and design a clinical trial that will ensure um, greater success in that trial and more effective medicines for the millions of patients that need them.